All right guys, so for this video, I just wanted to highlight some information about visible light. So visible light, if you recall, is in the middle of the electromagnetic spectrum, and it's going to include our different colors, okay? So first off, um, remember that we had our different shapes for our types of waves, and so light is going to specifically be a transverse wave. So when we're talking about light, um, you probably know from personal experience that light is um, a form of energy, light carries heat, light has color. We um, have already talked about some of the different types of wave behaviors, reflection, refraction, and diffraction with the D. Light can experience all of those different types of behaviors, okay? So um, when we talk about the speed of light, um, the phrase the speed of light or saying that electromagnetic waves move at light speed, that has a specific meaning. And so what we mean by that is that it's a set value, it's a constant value of 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, and that is the speed for all electromagnetic waves. Now, in general, I need you to understand that the speed at which uh, waves pass through a material or pass through a space is going to depend upon the medium that it's passing through and what is the density of the materials in that medium. So when we're talking specifically of visible light, um, visible light is going to travel the fastest in the least dense material, okay? So what is the absolute least dense situation that we can get? Well, that would be a vacuum or outer space. So if you're not familiar with the term vacuum um, in physics, we use that to represent an area where all of the molecules have been removed. There's absolutely zero atoms in that space. So you can think of it as outer space. So if we're talking about light traveling through outer space or through a vacuum, that is the same type of environment. Zero atoms, zero molecules. So through a vacuum or through outer space is where um, visible light would travel the fastest. If you have a question and it's asking you about what type of medium where outer space or a vacuum is not an option, then if we're saying it's actually traveling through some sort of material with atoms or particles, then I need you to know that it's traveling the fastest through air because it is the least dense of the environment um, that we have, okay? So we will get into more detail of the math that goes with this in a later lesson, but for right now, I just need you to understand when we say light speed or something travels at the speed of light, um, this is what we're talking about. And the fastest that light will travel is through a vacuum or outer space, unless it's a material, then it would be air, okay? All right, so polarization is kind of a tricky thing to illustrate. It's really best if demonstrated. Um, so I'll do my best here to help you out with this quickly. Polar polarizers are materials that are going to allow light to come through um, some, but not all of it. And here's what I mean by that. Light is unpolarized in nature. So remember that this is a form of energy. So if we think of our um, energy or our wave as being a kid, the more energy the kid has, the more active, the more fidgety, um, maybe even the more crazy and wild that kid would be, right? So if we're talking about a light ray, light is moving energy. And so it's not going to move in this nice, pretty, perfect pattern. Instead, it's going to oscillate on multiple axes. So it's in the x-axis, the y-axis, the z-axis. Remember in real life, it's three dimensions, right? So this illustration is showing you up at the top that we have unpolarized light and you can see that those arrows are indicating that it's in lots of different directions. But then after the light passes through the polarizer, it only allows one of those axes to pass through. And that's essentially what a polarizing material does. There's a couple other illustrations here, all trying to illustrate the same concept. Um, I do wanna take a second and focus on this illustration right over here. So when we say um, that a polarizer allows 50% of the light, even though the light is actually traveling on multiple axes, we typically just kind of focus on vertical and horizontal in our conversations. So this right here is a vertical polarizer because you can see that those um, polarizing little lines there are in the vertical direction. So the way that polarizers work is I want you to think of them as being 
like metal bars, uh, prison bars or something like that, right? If we have somebody who is tall and thin enough, they can turn sideways and slide between those bars. Vertically, they can pass through. But if we are looking at somebody who's maybe a little more horizontal, then they would not be allowed to make it through those thin vertical bars, right? Well, that's essentially what a polarizer does. It allows a vertical light to pass through vertical polarizers, but all horizontal light does not pass through. So what we would say is that just simply one polarizing filter allows 50% of the light to pass through. Um, if we look down here at the bottom, this is saying that we have a vertical polarizer here. So that's going to block half of the light. So all that we have coming out of that is vertical light. But then if we take a horizontal polarizer and we put it up with that vertical polarizer, well, the vertical polarizer allowed the vertical light through, but the horizontal would not. Only horizontal light can get through a horizontal polarizer. So if you notice, none of the light gets through. Why is that? Because we have both axes, both vertical and horizontal, that are being blocked. So if you need a visual, what you can do right now is take your hands and um, spread out your fingers. Face one hand so that it's pointing vertically. Place, place one hand so that it's uh, pointing horizontally and then lay them on top of each other. And you can see that essentially you've covered all of the space, right? Because that's what happens when you combine a vertical with a horizontal polarizer. All right, um, the last little bit that we need to talk about is colors. And basically um, my focus about colors is really gonna be how we see colors and the different combinations, but I didn't wanna skip over. Make sure you understand that everything on the electromagnetic spectrum follows this pattern that the longest wavelengths and um, lowest frequencies are gonna be farthest to the left on the spectrum. And then the shortest wavelengths and highest frequencies will be farthest to the right. Make sure you know your colors in order. Roy G. Biv is a very helpful acronym. And again, you'll be asked some questions about how does this wave compare to that wave talking about wavelength and frequency. So be prepared for that. But what I wanted to focus on with you today is um, how do we see colors and how do we make different colors? So the primary colors of light are red, green, and blue. You mix all of those colors together, you get white light. You remove all of those colors, you get what we refer to as black, okay? So I like to say, turn off all the lights, cover your eyes, and you see nothing. That's what we refer to as black, all right? Light is going to combine in what we call the additive process. So basically, we're going to be taking different beams of light. Each light has its own wavelength and frequency. Our eyes are capable of detecting red, green, and blue. So that's why those are the three primary colors of light. Um, based off of the signal that is um, sent to the brain from the optic nerves, the brain then interprets what we've seen, okay? So when we're talking about how do we see all of these other colors in between, it comes down to this additive process. So if you look at the illustration, you can see red, green, and blue are our primary colors. Those are the biggest circles. When we have green light and blue light that combine, that, oh, I should probably use a different color pen. Um, that is going to combine for what we call cyan. And so you will be asked questions about if I combine red and green, that makes yellow. If I combine red and blue, that makes cyan. And if I combine all three, that makes white. And you can see that right here in the middle of the circle. Okay. The um, way that we know what color objects are is based off of what is reflected from that material. So I need you to understand, um, look down here at the bottom, you only see the light that reaches your eyeball. So in this first illustration, we've got white light, which is a mixture of all the colors of light that shine down onto the object. That object is going to absorb everything except for blue. So blue bounces off the object and goes to your eyeball. So you received blue light, you interpret that as the color blue, okay? This example right here shows that we have white light shining down on something yellow. So you can see from the illustration, only yellow light reached your eyeball, so you see yellow, okay? It really, really, really is this simple, guys. When you were trying to answer questions about colors, always break it down to this. You only see the light that reaches your eye. 
all right? So when we're talking about pigments, basically the subtractive process is just the opposite. We are now trying to um, use the colors cyan, magenta, and yellow. So for pigments, these are our primary colors. Make sure you know that, cyan, magenta, and yellow are the primary colors for pigment. So if you've ever changed out um, a color printer, these right here are the colors that you see in your color printer. So what that means is that if my printer puts down cyan on the paper, blue light had to be reflected to my eyeball, green light had to be reflected to my eyeball, because blue plus green gives me cyan, right? So what was the only color of light left? Red. So red light was absorbed when we put down the color cyan. Now this might seem a little confusing. It might sound a little backwards because it is. That's why we call it the subtractive process. So please, I urge you guys to go to my Google site. Again, Google Miss Espinosa Physics on um, Google and the first result that comes up should be me. You're gonna go click on the videos on the left hand side, we're in the unit for light. Um, the top four videos are gonna be relevant for what you need to know um, right now during this chapter. So look for those videos there that explain how color works in a little more detail. Um, if you found the color wheel helpful, here's a color wheel for pigments. So once again, the big circles are your primary colors, cyan, magenta, and yellow. You can see that if we combine cyan and magenta, that makes blue. If we combine all three colors, cyan, magenta, and yellow, we get black right here in the middle. Okay. All right. Please make sure that you guys are um, taking time to look through the PowerPoints and study those. Um, please, please, please jump on the live meetings this week. Um, I expect that there will be some questions that you may have in trying to answer some of the practice problems. And um, it's kind of hard to explain all of that in a video, but I can absolutely do some more explaining and answer some specific questions for you. So I encourage you to try your hardest to get onto the live meetings this week to make sure you're all good to go for your assignment for this week and for your quiz. All right. Okay. You guys have a great day.